why you've been in quarantine for about a month now. Kind of the perfect time to write this kind of essay, huh? Since the birth of cinema itself, with the very first celluloid pictures being developed in the middle of Hyde Park by British inventor William Green, London has been not only a pivotal and important filmic location for those wishing to capture the beauty, and perhaps the cruelty of the city, but also the very heart of the industry that represents the rich cultural background of the city itself. To many, London represents the very centre of the British film industry, a place with heritage and history in every street with equal amounts of grime and glamour to appeal to a variety of genres and filmmakers, as well as being a place without typical creative restrictions that artists may find elsewhere. London has creative spaces in between suburbia and cosmopolitan office life dedicated to making films. For example, Ealing Studio, a longtime favourite of director Martin Scorsese, is placed in the middle of a suburban neighbourhood. Neighborhood. It also has a history of distributing independent films with such examples as the famous BFI London Film Festival, as well as a myriad of similar film festivals supporting everything from marginalised voices to unrecognised genres. The city also has multiple venues that offer filmmakers the means to share and distribute non-traditional cinema, such as experimental film and art film, with a broader and more diverse audience, all of which defining London as a unique and desirable place for filmmakers. And with it being home to 55% of the British film industry, despite only 13% of the English population actually living in London, it's simple to see why the city, rich with creative freedoms and cultural heritage, is so desirable to both British filmmakers and the overseas market. Of course this is a pretty problematic representation of the British film industry, since the only work most audiences are able to see is coming from those who can actually afford to live here. But I digress. As the hub as the British filmmaking industry, and traditionally being represented by the romantic comedies of working title, London has also been a significant cinematic location for horror films, arguably inspired by the gothic literature movement that dominated England's Victorian era in the form of gory penny dreadfuls, and an alarming rise in haunting crimes dominating the city. During the 19th and 20th centuries, London was the home of a number of canonical British horror writers, including Bram Stoker, Robert Stevenson, Mary Shelley, H.G. Wells and Edgar Allan Poe. And with the introduction of the monster movie genre through Universal pictures, which often focused on adapting texts by these writers, London was subsequently established as the location for classical horror through the disruption of its then culturally recognised heritage and prestige at the hands of these monsters, such as Dracula, Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, and The Invisible Man. Indeed, these films were set in London, and moreover depended on London for much of their narrative force. London was also the home of acclaimed horror and thriller director Alfred Hitchcock, and the city formed the backdrop of films such as Stage Fright, The 39 Steps, and The Lodger. The Lodger is especially connected to London's gory history History as a retelling of the famous Jack the Ripper killings of Whitechapel, one of the most retold British horror stories across cinema with almost 120 cinematic interpretations. About London, Hitchcock said, the sky was always grey, the rain was grey, the mud was grey, and I was grey. And this grey reflection of London would translate into his filmic choices of the city as well. Considering Hitchcock was an English director, and I think any English person would agree with his sentiment, I believe this brings about an interesting discussion regarding the comparison between the depiction of London from English directors to American directors. When London is advertised to tourists, particularly to American tourists, there's an understandable emphasis on sightseeing hotspots, Big Ben, London Bridge, the London Eye, the city's royal and historic heritage, Buckingham Palace, the Tower of London, the House of Parliament, and areas of densely packed shops and spending opportunities, Piccadilly Circus and Leicester Square, Oxford Circus, Harrods. Places that an everyday Londoner is familiar with, and probably sick of, these are consistently heaving with tourists and out-of-town liveliness. These are all things that are traditionally associated with a semantic field of tourism that makes up a significant part of the capital's cash flow, and offers a view that I will be defining as the touristic gaze of London for the rest of this essay. Often, in films depicting the city, this semantic field is taken advantage of thoroughly, and for an appropriate reason, because it's appealing to overseas audiences that may not be familiar with London and want to see these famous sites. Therefore, over the course of this essay, I will be arguing that by using tropes associated with the horror genre, filming techniques and contextual background, pertinent British directors use the horror genre as a means of disrupting this touristic gaze and the more traditional cinematic representations of London. But first, to properly define the ideas of the touristic gaze of London in British cinema, it's important to understand where these representations come from. The British romantic comedy is one of the most successful genres that depicts this gaze of London, using significant locations to backgrounds of love stories. Charles professing his I think I love you to Cassie on London's South Bank, in Four Weddings and a Funeral, Peter 
marrying Julia in Oxford Circus in Love Actually, a pregnant Bridget being carried through Waterloo by Mark in Bridget Jones's Baby, just to name a few. All of these films very deliberately represent London as a destination for love, and use the urban setting to not only enhance the against the odd city romance, but also, at least in my opinion, as a means of appealing to the overseas, often American viewer who are more accustomed to viewing London from the eye of a tourist. Similar things are done with horror rom-com, and big favourite of mine, An American Werewolf in London, where a love story between an American and an English person unfolds across the city, echoing pretty similar beats to Notting Hill, though the conclusion is a little gorier. Just a little. This more touristic representation of London becomes especially relevant when we consider the foreign box office gross of these undeniably British romantic comedies are almost always over 65% of their worldwide gross, differing substantially to films like 28 Days Later, whose foreign box office was less than half of its gross. While it could be argued that this is because the romantic comedy is an easier sell compared to the horror film, I believe it's evidence that appealing to a touristic and romanticised gaze of London directly correlates with how well, financially, a British film will do in foreign countries. When discussing the idea of London's representation in the horror genre, it's pretty important to identify an origin text which influenced future horror films which would use London as their primary setting. And while silent film depicting London had been on screen before, Dracula, an adaptation of Bram Stoker's original text and product of American production company Universal Pictures, is generally considered to be the first feature-length horror film to depict London on the big screen. Dracula is a 1931 monster movie directed by Todd Browning and widely considered to be the text that kickstarted the boom of the monster movie genre in the early 20th century. As a text, Dracula is pretty important for a number of reasons. The titular character of Count Dracula is the formative example of the exotic and seductive vampire. As well as that, he's commonly discussed amongst horror scholarship regarding The Other, a horror concept associated with themes of repression and otherness, sometimes represented as a foreign body, human, monster, alien, you name it, dismantling the puritanical values of those they invade. In Dracula's case, he does this through the means of tricking and possessing British people, specifically British women, and interrupting the norm of repressed female sexuality and strict cultural heritage. Already I'm sensing a pretty strong theme here. But what does this have to do with London? In her article about Dracula and its use of London geography to highlight a number of imperial and national anxieties, Jill Davies cites that the Dracula novel and its reference to London maps, novels, and indeed tourist hotspots such as Piccadilly and the West End, as a means of highlighting the at the time common anxieties about foreigners infiltrating English soil. And with the casting of Hungarian American Bella Lugosi of the Count himself, making this all very much text rather than just subtext, this only validates these anxieties of otherness even more. See, while the film was shot in the Hollywood backlots of Universal Pictures, Dracula still very deliberately presents a London that was rich with heritage and regality, very much the association that American audiences had of England at the time of Dracula's release. The audience has shown lavish manners, the theatre, opera houses, well-to-do businessmen in three-piece suits and expensive clothing as a representation of London, which makes Dracula's effortless infiltration of this high society as a dangerous foreigner that much more frightening to the viewer. In this context, Dracula is no longer an other but a neighbour. Well Wealth, regality and heritage, everything the audience knows of England at the time is so easily replicated by Dracula that it essentially becomes meaningless. Dracula is representative of the dated, but not as dated as we hoped, cultural anxieties surrounding foreign entities infiltrating places of prestige and wealth, or the tourist hotspots of the London map, either or, an outsider dismantling the rich association the audience has of the country. And this is a concept will be seen coming up in a few of my other case studies in the future. But to sum up this particular case study, as an American text, Dracula uses London as a setting to signify cultural heritage and wealth, but subverts this pretty harshly by representing the British people who inhabit it as foolish and easily manipulated by the genius foreign body that Count Dracula represents. In the years following the release of Dracula and the plethora of horror pictures that came after it, horror semantic field of London continued to change, consistently subverting audiences' associations with London with each new release. My next group of case studies will examine some of these texts with a focus on the work of British directors and their representations of London's touristic semantic field Field, as well as their in general depiction of life in London. 28 Days Later is a British horror film released in 2002 and directed by Danny Boyle. The film depicts a post-apocalyptic London four weeks after a zombie outbreak and follows a band of ragtag survivors trying to navigate the dangerous urban setting and fight back against not only the rage-filled infected but also a group of hostile soldiers that may pose more threat than the infected themselves. 28 Days Later is widely considered to be a seminal horror text amongst film scholarship, not only because of a perhaps somewhat unusual depiction of the zombie as athletic and rabid rather than slow and shambling, but 
but also because of its oppressive representation of the desolate urban space and its total subversion of the tourist gaze of London. As lead Jim wakes up from a month-long coma and walks around a vacant London, kicking plastic models of Big Ben, mementos of London's value to the tourist into the empty streets and shouting for anyone who might hear him, the audience is taken on an eerie sightseeing tour of the city. Oxford Circus, Trafalgar Square, the London Eye, Westminster Bridge, Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament are just a few sites that we see, as well as a distorted and hazy London skyline. Broken down double-decker buses clog the roads, rendered useless without commuters or tourists. Our protagonist walks down empty roads into an equally empty Piccadilly Circus, utterly silent despite being so recognised in our cultural zeitgeist to be one of the busiest places on earth. Appropriately for the zombie genre, London is a graveyard. Through the use of location, the film positions Jim, a long-time resident of London, as a tourist in his own city. He enters the hospital as part of a majority, in a sense, and wakes up a foreigner lost in the streets that he once knew so well. Boyle positions the audience in a very similar way, knowing that we too recognise the sights that we're seeing and we feel just as lost as Jim does because the very idea of London being so empty and desolate is so far removed from us. Moments later, in a short walk from Buckingham Palace, Jim picks up worthless £50 notes around the Duke of York's steps, though it's clear that he's unsure of what to do with them after. London is seen as one of the richest cities in the world and yet one of the poorer cities and the stark differences between very close areas can be striking. For many, represented in romantic comedy in the heritage film genre, London represents opportunity, a way to live a better life, make better money, send money back to a family, and the idea of something uncontrollable coming and dismantling all of that is understandably horrifying. These ideas align closely with horror directly correlating with an audience's fears of social change from Jankovic and Hutchings. Throughout the short montage following the evocative opening, the film employs heavy use of extreme long shots with very few close-ups and full shots, using mini digital video cameras to reduce cost and setup time, making for a more realistic and almost documentary approach to the film and ensuring as much time was spent on capturing the desolate city as possible. Through this, Jim is barely visible on the screen and the scenery is the thing that takes up the majority of the audience's attention. The diversity of camera angles are not only used to show how vacant the city now is and how isolated Jim is at the beginning of the film, but also to showcase and represent the once iconic buildings and tourist sites associated with London and how distorted and aptly post-apocalyptic they now are. Additionally, through the use of digital cameras, the film uses an intentional sickly and muted colour palette to create a texture, as Boyle puts it, to the film that would make familiar sights feel strange and somehow wrong. Boyle wanted to depict a more realistic apocalyptic London, something that could easily happen next Wednesday, and the use of the barren urban landscape and low budget but effective filmic techniques achieve this strive for realism. Additionally, these techniques also subvert and challenge the traditional semantic field associated with London that the conventional cinematic landscape has presented before. While we see these tourist hotspots on screen, they're empty and eerie, devoid of any kind of life that we normally associated with them, and the cultural heritage of these prestigious buildings are lost. When it comes to British film, not only is the subversion of typical touristic semantic fields of London effective in the horror genre, a more realistic approach to representing all area of London does similar things with these ideas of subversion. 28 Days Later deliberately messes with our association with tourist London, and films like Attack the Block, for example, show us a more authentic London outside the gaze of the majority, or white and upper class. While it has nothing that an overseas viewer may associate with London, no use of typical London imagery like in 28 Days Later, no heritage or prestige like in Dracula, it has imagery that a London native would associate with the city. Attack the Block is a British science fiction horror film released in 2011 and directed by Joe Cornish. The film depicts a gang of teenagers based in South London and their fight to defend their neighbourhood, or the block, from aliens out of blood. The film also openly discusses themes of racism and classism in urban areas of London and makes direct commentary about the often racial bias of the police system in those areas. For Jim, in 28 Days Later, the breakdown of the system is the horror, whereas for Moses and the gang on the block, the system itself is the horror. You know what I reckon, yeah? I reckon the Fed sent them anyway. Government probably bred those creatures to kill black boys. First they sent drugs to the ends. Then they sent guns. Now they sent monsters to get us. They don't care, man. We ain't killing each other fast enough. So they decided to speed up the process. At the time of its release, Attack the Block was given critical and audience praise for being a horror slash science fiction film, not only set in the more underused and urban areas of London, but also as a text that prioritised the voices of black and working class teenagers and displayed realistic characters and their struggles in the horror heavy story of invasion and being trapped in one's own home. And because of these attributes, it's still considered to be a seminal text and maintains a vocal cult following. The film is unapologetic about its depiction of the realistic threats to its characters too. Over the course of 
of the narrative, not only are the aliens a threat to the characters, and indeed the block that they're fiercely protective of, drug dealers, gangsters, and the police are also posed as much of a threat to them. Throughout the film, it seems the only thing that promised them any kind of safety is the unspoken brotherhood between the working class boys of the block and their allegiance to one another, echoing ideas of the importance of community and brotherhood in these working class neighbourhoods. Attack the Block uses the horror genre as a means of facilitating the idea of community, whereas 28 Days Later facilitates the idea of societal breakdown and collapse. Director Cornish spoke about wanting to represent the London that he knew, being brought up in South London himself, and spoke about the importance of being able to put the invasion scenario in a place it hadn't been before. The London that's depicted in Attack the Block subverts the idea of the traditional touristic semantic field because it depicts a more urban, maybe more threatening London that is unfamiliar to the screen, but one that's unique to the director himself and recognisable to audiences in those neighbourhoods. The film goes to as far as to use dialect and speech patterns that are unique to the boroughs of South London and paints a realistic picture of the non-traditional and indeed non-white and working class London on the big screen. Different from 28 Days Later and its sickly yellow and orange colour palette and wide angles to create a feeling of isolation and solitude in the open streets of London, Attack the Block opts for a different approach. Often filming on location in tight estate corridors, elevators and even dumpsters, with a crowd of rowdy teenagers and terrified adults always in shot, the film uses more close-ups and medium shots of the cast to make each shot appear more crowded and hectic, filling with the tone of the film. These filming techniques also add to some of the more comedic moments of the film, when the teens are all talking over each other, particularly in combination with the well-used shot reverse shot, where the audience can see something, an armed group of police and aliens crawling up on the walls, and the rest of the cast cannot. Additionally, Attack the Block uses harsh, industrial lighting from its on-location set and hues of bright blues and purples to highlight its main cast's dark skin, and to make the council estate setting appear otherworldly and alien, with a section of the film taking place under the eerie glow of a UV light. It's a realistic setting, indeed a realistic London, the horror genre renders it otherworldly and strange. Similarly, the use of modern soundtrack, hip-hop and rap music complements the setting and the unapologetic blackness of the characters and indeed some of the threats that they encounter along the way at the hands of drug dealers and gangsters. All of these techniques used together make the block feel like a self-enclosed world and it operates as a space outside of the reality, outside of London. It's both an urban death trap and a home worth defending, a place where a different set of rules are abided by but also a place where members of the community are fiercely protected. When the gang believes Sam is an outsider, she's mugged and perceived as a threat, but when they know she herself belongs to the block, she's defended and protected and seen as part of the community. Attack the Block represents the block, a poorly maintained council estate in South London, as almost a character in its own right, and not only subverts the semantic field of cinematic London, but also subverts our own expectations of what this kind of London is supposed to be. Through the horror genre, a working class London is represented as strong and unified, different from 28 Days Later and Dracula, where the prestigious upper middle class London is broken down. Additionally, Attack the Block also acts as a direct subversion of the hoodie horror films that were depicted urban London as threatening and desolate, and the youth that inhabit it as criminals. Films such as Harry Brown and Eden Lake played with the audience's fears of people of colour and the working class. At the beginning of the film, Moses and his gang are intimidating and rough, but the audience learns that this is because of their upbringing and the outside perceptions of their home and community that they die to defend. Cornish said that he didn't want the gang to be seen as one-note characters, but for them to be complicated and morally grey, and through the narrative and filming techniques, they are seen as such. And when Moses almost sacrifices himself for his friends and the block, and the camera lingers on him, bloodied and hanging on a Union Jack flag, a symbol traditionally recognised as the English flag by tourists rather than English people themselves, he is depicted as the hero the narrative needs him to be. While Attack the Block and 28 Days Later presented us as a native Londoner in the urban space, an important facet of horror theory is that of the unfamiliar and the unseen being the main threat the protagonist faces. Combining this with the unfamiliar setting, for example, a train station in a foreign country as seen in Creep, it can result in an effective means of horror and subversion of the previously discussed semantic fields associated with the tourist London. Creep is a British-German horror film released in 2004 and directed by Christopher Smith. The film depicts lead Kate, a German party girl, and her night trapped in a London tube station pursued by a myriad of dangers amongst the labyrinths of tunnels of the London underground. While Creep isn't as celebrated as my previous case studies are, and therefore doesn't have as much written about it, it does pose interesting ideas about how a foreign body navigates the unfamiliar space within the horror context. As previously discussed, a facet of horror film theory is the unfamiliar and unseen as a threat 
threat. And in a film like Creep, the location itself is as much a threat to Kate as the creature lurking in the darkness. From the beginning of the film, the narrative establishes her as somewhat lost in a city, a tourist in a way. She can't catch a taxi and she struggles with the underground tickets and rail barriers. Different from Jim being reduced to a tourist in his own city and Moses' strength coming from how well he knows his neighbourhood, Kate is clueless from the start and only becomes more so amidst the labyrinth of tunnels of the underground station. This is particularly evident when she's compared to the natives of the Charing Cross station, of London in a sense, homeless man Jimmy and sewer worker George. Charing Cross representing a central, expensive, London location, similar to the central locations in Canary Wharf station in 28 Days Later, here associated with a rich party girl tourist. Through this characterization, Creep negotiates ideas of the homeless and working class, the marginalised identities, being the authentic representatives of the more urban and dangerous London. And with this, it subverts the white, upper middle class ideas of the traditional semantic field that Kate herself represents before she is placed at their level at the end of the film. Additionally, the London underground as a setting in itself aligns with touristic imagery of London, with pivotal romantic comedies such as About Time and Sliding Doors using tube carriages and stations as places of impossible love, and the setting is recognised by even overseas viewers. Creep also subverts these more romantic ideas and even deliberately challenges them at times, using evocative imagery such as sexual harassment and attempted rape. Not exactly love actually now, is it? Some London commuters, in an informal discussion about horror set in London, even admitted that the film had put them off of travelling late at night for a while. Here, horror and the genre taking place in London directly has a significant influence on a place normally associated with being familiar and even somewhat mundane. Similar to the techniques used in Attack the Block, Creep uses tight close-ups and two shots and additional POV shots from the titular Creep, filmed with a shaky handheld camera also employed through the rest of the film, to enhance the claustrophobic energy which drives the majority of the plot. Director Smith, inspired by 80s slasher film and hammer horror movies was granted access to decommissioned train stations and shot on location for the majority of the film as a means of keeping the film as realistic and frightening as possible. Oppressive darkness fits with the underground location which works with the unnatural flickering halogen lighting of the late night station and tube cars, making every colour appear artificial and sickly, representing here a fake and forgotten London, a London seen by very few people. Combined with the unnatural blues, greens and yellows amongst the shadows of the underground layer of the creep, the resounding effect is an eerie, barely recognisable maze, where danger lurks around every corner. Combined with quick cut editing and an atmospheric, specifically designed score of the film, these techniques enhance the way that Creep challenges the visual imagery associated with the touristic London and subvert the ways audiences are used to seeing the London underground. A place associated with helping tourists has trapped them and directly threatened them, done similarly with the overturned buses in 28 Days Later and indeed the massacre containing black cabs and red buses in American Werewolf. Best said by Berman, the underground provides a fitting environment of their disconnectedness. Labyrinthine, mechanical and claustrophobic. In the empty tube complex, cries go unheard and lives are forgotten. Closed circuit cameras spy on activities but no one's really watching. Creep also makes direct commentary on the rising problem of London homelessness and themes of abandonment in urban areas. The film uses both its narrative, filming techniques and location choices to create on-screen discussions about the feelings of abandonment that homeless people face living in the city, echoing ideas of London-based horror. Illustrative examples being Dracula attacking a girl handing out flowers hours, the American werewolf targeting groups of homeless people, and Jim and Selina being forced out of their homes in 28 Days Later. This represents additional real-life horrors of Jack the Ripper, who focused his attacks on working class and homeless women, and many other cases of the London homeless being targets of violence. Homeless people don't go missing. Homeless people are missing. These themes play an evocative role in Kate's journey as she turns from a person of privilege, sneering and uninterested in the struggles of her saviours, to abandon in her own right. In the final shot of the film, she's dirtied and bloody from her assault on the creep, like Jim's attack on the soldiers and Moses' attack on the aliens, and scared, clutching an injured dog onto her lap like her guide before her. This completely subverts the cocky party girl character that we were presented at the beginning of the film, and additionally aligns with theories of character arcs and horror genre posed by Mattel in which a mature adult learns a key life lesson over the course of a series or film and ends up a changed person. It's the experiences that Kate has with those outside of the majority that shapes her into a final girl figure and what subverts the audience expectations associated with the cinematic London. Since the early years of cinema established in heritage flicks and the romantic comedy, London has been written as a place of rich history, strong cultural backgrounds 
and touristic imagery. It's been shown as a place of opportunity, love, success, heartbreak, friendship and community, and most importantly, a picturesque haven for the overseas tourist. However, through the horror genre, everything both natives and overseas viewers recognise as London is changed into a landscape of empty landmarks and places traditionally seen as locations of love and history are transformed into the dangerous and terrifying by the unfamiliar entities, foreign bodies and assimilated hordes. The horror genre directly disrupts our perceived romanticised ideas of London and presents a London that is just as much a threat as the vermin who inhabit it. Hey video nasties, thank you for watching this video essay. Be sure to check out my Twitter for any hot takes on horror, and if you want to support me and my channel, consider donating to my Patreon. I have a couple of tiers all with their own perks and I've been uploading content on there recently, so check it out if you're interested. Make sure you stick around for my next video essay, which I'm very excited for and I'm looking forward to sharing with you. So yeah, thank you, stay safe and socially distant, and remember, stay spooky.